Okay, um, welcome to the third lecture, uh, fourth lecture. Okay, and today we are going to actually apply some of the theory that we've learned to design uh, new steel. So, just to remind you of the mechanism that we came up with for the transformation to bainite, imagine that bainite forms exactly like martensite, where the plate of ferrite is fully supersaturated with carbon, but because we are transforming at a relatively high temperature, the carbon has an opportunity to escape into the austenite. If we are at a relatively high temperature, then the carbon escapes completely, leaving the plate of ferrite free from carbon. And eventually, this excess carbon will precipitate as cementite between the plates of ferrite. If we transform to lower bainite, that means a relatively lower transformation temperature, then there is an opportunity for carbides to precipitate inside the plate, rather like tempering of martensite. And because we precipitate some carbides inside the ferrite, we get less carbon partitioning into the remaining austenite, and therefore we have finer precipitates of cementite in a lower bainite microstructure. So I explained that this is actually tougher than this microstructure uh, because of the fine scale of the carbides here even though lower bainite is stronger. Now, of course, when we go to even higher strength steels, these are like inclusions. They cause fracture. Okay? Cementite particles are hard and brittle, and if you apply a large enough stress, then they will crack. And when we make high strength steels, we make them extremely clean, you know, very free from non-metallic inclusions. So then the cementite particles become the particles which initiate fracture. So bainitic steels of this kind containing fairly coarse carbides have not really succeeded in achieving the same toughness and strength combinations that you can get with tempered martensite because in tempered martensite you can control the tempering process and achieve fine carbides. So typically, these are the sort of carbide particles that we see inside normal bainitic steels, which have a high carbon concentration. Okay, so when I say a high carbon concentration of the order of 0 0.3, 0 0.4 weight percent carbon, you see fairly coarse cementite particles. And in the case of cleavage fractures, these particles initiate cleavage cracks. And in the case of ductile fractures, they initiate the nucleation of voids. So inside the dimples that you see on the fracture surface, you'll be able to find cementite particles. And the consequence of those particles is that you get a reduction in toughness. So here is the test temperature for a Charpy test and the Charpy impact energy. And supposing we create a steel uh, with a bainitic microstructure and coarse carbides, then you get a reduction in toughness and an increase in the impact transition temperature. So these carbides are bad in the context of very high strength steels and when you have a medium carbon concentration. Obviously if you reduce the carbon concentration to less than 0 0.05 weight percent then the carbides will be fine. Okay? So in, the, in that case they are not the initiating sites for fracture. So how can I stop these carbides from precipitating. Any ideas? Yeah. What elements can I add to the steel which stop cementite from precipitating? Sorry? Uh, titanium will capture the carbon yeah, and form titanium carbides which are cubic in shape and coarse because they form at a very high temperature. So we don't want that either. Yeah. Hmm? Silicon and anything else? Yeah, you're right. You're quite right. Yeah. And how does silicon and aluminium stop the precipitation of cementite? What is the mechanism? Yeah, we, we know very well, you know, even from history, if you take cast iron, cast iron contain something like three weight percent of carbon, if you add silicon to the cast iron, then instead of a white cast iron, you get a grey cast iron. White cast iron is full of cementite, grey cast iron is full of graphite. Okay? 
So we've known this for more than a century, that if you add elements like silicon to cast iron, then we stop primary cementite from forming, and you end up with cast iron containing graphite instead of very hard cast iron full of cementite. So how does silicon stop the precipitation of cementite? What is the mechanism? Any ideas? I think you all know about this because trip steels are designed like this, but do you know why these elements stop the precipitation of cementite from austenite? Okay, let me give you a clue. So the mechanism uh, involves partitioning of carbon from the supersaturated plate into the remaining austenite. So it's this precipitation from austenite that we have to stop, uh, the formation of cementite from austenite. Now, if you look at the solubility of carbon in cementite, it's almost zero. Okay? It has virtually zero solubility in cementite. But when you form cementite at a low temperature, there is no opportunity for the carbon to escape while the cementite is growing. Yeah, so when we talk about low temperature, I'm saying 400 degrees centigrade, the cementite is forced to absorb any silicon which is in your steel, even though it does not want it. So once you force silicon into cementite, its energy increases. Right? It becomes less stable. And here are some first principles calculations done by Jehun Jang and Ingi Kim in GIFT, where when you substitute an iron atom with a silicon atom. So here is Fe3C, and this is Fe3C, but one of the iron atoms is substituted with silicon. You get a dramatic increase in energy. And here, two silicon atoms have been, uh, sub no, sorry, silicon has been substituted in a different site within the unit cell of cementite. And again, you get a large increase in the energy of the cementite. So if you force the silicon to go into the cementite, then it becomes much less stable. And in some circumstances, if you've added enough silicon, then it doesn't form at all. And the same should apply to aluminium. Now, why did we need to do this analysis by first principles calculations? Because if you have virtually zero solubility of silicon in cementite, then you cannot actually make measurements you cannot make thermodynamic measurements. So if you try to do a phase diagram calculation, you don't have the thermodynamic data. So these thermodynamic data were created using first principles calculations. And this is a wonderful application of first principles calculations because here you cannot even in principle do an experiment. Okay? So that's where you can only do calculations. So just to summarize that, the mechanism by which uh, cementite forms, uh, cementite precipitation is prevented. So, cementite precipitation is prevented. Um, let me just make this pen finer. prevented because one, uh, the solubility of, cement, uh, of silicon in cementite is negligible. Okay. So this is, this is important. Solubility of silicon. I'll use the same symbol theta for cementite throughout. You know, alpha is ferrite, gamma is austenite, and theta is cementite. So solubility of silicon in cementite is negligible. And the second crucial thing is that during the bainite reaction, you're forming cementite at a low temperature. So during bainite, reaction theta forms 
at a low temperature. That means that the silicon cannot partition during the growth of the cementite. Therefore, silicon cannot partition during cementite growth. It is, it is basically forced to be in the cementite. Okay. It is forced into theta and therefore theta becomes unstable. So the important point is that if the cementite formed at a high temperature, you know, above, let's say, 600 degrees centigrade, then the silicon could partition and there's no problem in precipitating cementite. So in the same steel, if I form perlite, perlite forms at a relatively high temperature, around 600 degrees centigrade, silicon slightly retards the transformation, but it doesn't stop the precipitation of cementite. So you have to have two conditions. First, that the silicon is forced into the cementite lattice. In other words, that you have to form it at the cementite at a low temperature in order to use silicon to suppress the precipitation of cementite. Is everyone happy with that? So that is the mechanism by which silicon stops the precipitation of cementite from austenite. And probably aluminum works in the same way, but we don't have the same kind of evidence that I've shown you here for the effect of aluminum on cementite precipitation. So it's possible now, you know, given this kind of thermodynamic data, to do calculations on the growth rate of cementite in which you force the silicon and therefore to calculate how much silicon you need in order to suppress the precipitation of cementite. Roughly speaking, you know, for the kind of steels that we are interested in, you need in excess of about one weight percent of silicon to stop the precipitation of cementite. Okay, so let's carry on. Let's imagine that we study three different alloys, very simple alloys. Uh, all of them contain a certain level of silicon to stop the precipitation of cementite. And we've got carbon concentrations that I'll explain to you later. And some elements to give you hardenability because you want to stop the precipitation of other kinds of uh, uh, transformation products such as perlite and so forth. Okay? Now, when we transform these isothermally into bainite, we get the microstructure which I've shown you previously. Extremely fine plates of bainitic ferrite. So remember this scale is one micrometer. So when you have a thin plate shape, the grain size is approximately twice the thickness of the plate. Okay? because the grain size is a mean linear intercept, right? You measure grain size as a mean linear intercept, and when you have a thin plate shape, the probability of slip happening in the plane of the plate is negligible. So the mean linear intercept is about twice the thickness. So here we are achieving a grain size which is a fraction of a micrometer just by phase transformation. You don't need any complex thermomechanical processing. Second is we've suppressed cementite precipitation. So in between these plates, we've got these regions of austenite. And austenite does not have a ductile brittle transition temperature. So if I, if I plot that diagram which I drew in the last lecture, where I'm doing the um, cleavage stress as a function of temperature, so here we have temperature and this is the stress and this is the stress required to cleave the crystal cleavage and 
if I now plot on this the temperature dependence of the strength of austenite then for all temperatures it's easier to flow by plastic deformation so this is austenite and therefore you do not get austenite breaking by a cleavage mechanism you do not have a ductile brittle transition for austenite in the case of ferrite I pointed out to you that you get an intersection between the flow curve and the cleavage stress and that's why you get a ductile brittle transition so one major advantage of having austenite in the microstructure is that we have no ductile brittle transition temperature for these regions of retained austenite now is there any other any other advantage of having the austenite there that you can think of why do we often want austenite in our steel yeah. trip effect so transformation induced plasticity now we are going to do this in a bit more detail later but when you pull the material the transformation of the austenite into martensite actually adds to the plasticity of your steel so even though the material is strong you can get a high ductility and the solubility of hydrogen in austenite is high but the diffusion rate of hydrogen into the austenite is orders of magnitude smaller than that in ferrite what that means is that hydrogen will have difficulty in getting into your steel that's a good thing because when you put your steel into service you don't really want hydrogen to get into the steel by corrosion reactions etc okay. so hydrogen embrittlement becomes less of a problem if you have sufficient austenite surrounding the ferrite regions okay. so there are many advantages to having this beautiful microstructure which is extremely fine and I'm just going to list the advantages I've forgotten how to how to change this page okay let me clear it okay so let's let's list uh, the advantages the first one is that we achieve an incredibly fine structure just by phase transformation okay. so we achieve incredibly fine structure by phase transformation now we've got a mixture of ferrite and austenite and this austenite is created using an extremely cheap alloying element yeah it's basically stabilized by the partitioning of carbon and you cannot get a cheaper alloying element than carbon okay. so the austenite is stabilized by an extremely cheap alloying element so gamma is stabilized by cheap solute which is carbon okay. whereas you know the original trip steels were actually with very large concentrations of nickel something in excess of 20 weight percent yeah. here we are just using carbon to stabilize the austenite average carbon concentration is quite low about 0.4 but when you partition it the austenite ends up with a carbon concentration in excess of one weight percent and therefore it becomes stable so we're using extremely cheap uh, solute uh, number three is that uh, hydrogen has a very low diffusivity in austenite and that is always a good thing when you're dealing with high strength steels so hydrogen has very low 
diffusivity in gamma. So you should reduce hydrogen embrittlement problems. Because we have removed the carbon from the bainite and partitioned it into the austenite, that makes the bainitic ferrite ductile as well. Because if ferrite contains carbon in solid solution, that definitely embrittles it. That's why you have to temper martensite when you use martensite. So uh, number four is that the carbon concentration of the bainitic ferrite is much less than the average value. So carbon concentration of bainitic ferrite is much lower than average of steel. That makes it tough makes the ferrite And we are also getting our strength from the very fine grain structure. And grain size is the one of the only mechanisms by which you can increase both the strength and toughness. Okay? Very often when you try to increase the strength, the toughness will deteriorate. But with grain size refinement, you increase both strength and toughness. So we have a uh, very fine grain size. Uh, the, really the strength is produced by grain size effect strength due to fine grain structure and grain refinement is the only mechanism for both increasing the strength and toughness increasing strength and toughness. So the very simple addition of silicon to our steel together with transformation into a mixture of bainitic ferrite and austenite gives us what appears to be an ideal microstructure. So this appears to be ideal microstructure. Everyone happy so far? And of course, uh, if you remember, each plate is only about 10 micrometers in length because the plasticity associated with the shape deformation stops it from growing once it reaches about that length. So it's actually finer than martensite. Okay, let's have a look at the toughness of this wonderful microstructure. Right. When we actually do an experiment to measure the toughness, it's terrible. Yeah? You can see here that the impact transition temperature is more than 100 degrees centigrade. So that's completely unacceptable for any engineering material that below 100 degrees centigrade you get fracture by cleavage, right? 
and this is the alloy that I listed in one of those tables earlier 0.4 carbon 3 manganese and 2 silicon so something is very wrong with our science here that we have an ideal microstructure and it's giving extremely poor properties so let's let's just try and think what is the problem so I'm going to show you an optical micrograph of this structure <coughs> here we are so look at the scale over here it's 50 micrometers so this is an optical micrograph and if I looked at these bainite sheaves in a transmission electron micrograph then they would look exactly like the ones that I showed you earlier which are extremely fine and with films of austenite in between them but notice one more thing we have these large regions of untransformed high carbon austenite you can see these large white regions which have a scale of the order of 50 micrometers which are untransformed high carbon austenite now when you increase the size of austenite it becomes easier for it to transform into martensite okay. so as soon as I apply a stress to this material the first regions which trip are these regions and they form 50 micrometer sized regions of untempered high carbon martensite so it's like creating a beautiful fine structure and then throwing a huge rock into the structure which is brittle now why do we have these large regions of austenite left in our material even though we have transformed isothermally for a long time to generate bainite any ideas why does this material refuse to transform further because I, w I don't want those large regions of austenite I want them to transform into the fine mixture of bainitic ferrite and films of retained austenite why does the reaction stop T0 curve we have a thermodynamic limit that as soon as the composition of the austenite reaches the T0 boundary it cannot transform further so here is the uh, t0 curve yeah and this is the average carbon concentration of the steel and if I'm transforming at this temperature then I can only get bainite until the austenite composition reaches the red line so if I apply the lever rule to the t0 curve then I should be able to calculate the maximum amount of bainitic ferrite that I can obtain the lever rule is basically that the amount of bainitic ferrite is given by this distance here divided by this distance assuming that the ferrite has zero carbon concentration okay. is everyone happy with the lever rule you know you apply it to a phase diagram to work out the volume fraction of a phase that you the maximum volume fraction of a phase so it's this distance here divided by this distance which if I express mathematically is the carbon concentration given by T0 minus the average carbon concentration of the steel divided by the carbon concentration given by the T0 curve and the carbon concentration of ferrite which we are going to assume is zero so I want you to give me three ways okay, three ways in which I can increase the volume fraction of bainite so that I can get rid of the large regions of austenite okay. if you look at this equation there should be three ways of doing this so I'm waiting for you to give me the answer okay. what are the three ways in which I can increase the volume fraction of bainite because if I can't then we are stuck the, this is a thermodynamic limit to the amount of transformation even if you can't think metallurgically think mathematically what are the three ways I could increase the volume fraction of bainitic ferrite this is the volume fraction of bainitic ferrite right this is the symbol for bainitic ferrite
Yeah, I think you have an idea. How can I increase this? Come on, guys. Guys is uh, refers to both men and women. Yeah, it's a asexual word. So. <laughs> Yeah. So if I if I reduce the average concentration of carbon, that means I shift this line towards the uh, towards the vertical axis, then I can increase the volume fraction of bainite. So what this says is, if I actually reduce the carbon concentration of the steel, I should get more bainite, get rid of those large regions of austenite, and I would not compromise strength because I'm increasing the amount of bainite. Yeah. So it goes against our normal thinking that if I reduce the carbon concentration I actually get an increase in strength because I'm increasing the amount of bainite. Second method see this this curve depends on the substitutional solutes in our material yeah so if we modify the substitutional solutes so for example manganese and so forth then we can shift this curve to higher carbon concentrations Okay, so that's the second method. And the third method is why not lower the transformation temperature? Okay? There is of course a limit. What is that limit? How low can I go? Martin size start temperature. Okay, so the three ways of improving the toughness, uh, uh, of increasing the volume fraction of bainitic ferrite. One is reduce X bar, okay, the average carbon concentration of the material. Two is modify substitutional solutes to move the T zero curve. To higher carbon okay and the third is to reduce the transformation temperature temperature but this is limited by the fact that we mustn't produce martensite okay so the lowest I can go is close to MS okay. so but limited by the martensite start temperature. And remember we started with a steel which was Fe 0 0.4 carbon, uh, 3 manganese and 2 silicon weight percent. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to cut the carbon concentration by a factor of 2. So the prediction from this very simple theory is that if I make a new steel which is Fe 0 0.2 carbon 3 manganese 2 silicon I should get an improvement in toughness without a loss of strength okay and I know and I'll illustrate to you later that if I substitute manganese by nickel then the T0 curve moves to a higher carbon concentration so the second modification that we make T0 curve you can calculate very easily just download some software from our website yeah? uh, so we will keep the carbon concentration the same because we are trying to prove a point here okay and instead of manganese we will use nickel and two silicon so these are the two uh, steels which are predicted from our simple theory that if we do as as we expect, we will improve the toughness without a loss of strength. Okay, so here are those three alloys that I just wrote about. In one case, we are going to cut the carbon concentration by a factor of two. 
and in the second case we are going to change the substitutional alloying addition to shift the T0 curve to the right hand side okay to higher carbon concentrations so we made these alloys and uh, we achieved the required refinement of the structure in terms of getting rid of the large regions of austenite so this is the one with half the carbon concentration okay and we have this beautiful microstructure without the large regions of austenite and this is the high carbon 0.4 carbon but with a higher nickel concentration and the next slide that I'll show you is absolutely amazing because this is the original impact transition curve with you know a transition temperature being more than 100 degrees centigrade and these are the two new alloys where we've shifted the transition temperature by 200 degrees centigrade just by a simple equation so the toughness has improved dramatically in one case maintaining the carbon concentration in the other case by reducing the carbon concentration by a factor of two and without compromising the strength anybody can improve the toughness by reducing the strength okay but here we are both maintaining the strength and dramatically improving the toughness so large regions of austenite which are unstable to applied stress and which decompose into high carbon martensite untempered martensite obviously are going to be bad for your steel what we want is the nice thin films of austenite between the plates of ferrite everyone happy with that okay so now I'm going to show you some products which come out of this very simple theory so does anybody recognize what these are sections of rail railway lines yeah and they're made in different sizes depending on applications uh, what is the normal structure of railway lines perlite yeah and somebody else now tell me what is the structure of perlite sorry yeah but describe to me how how is the mixture is it spherical particles of cementite in ferrite or lamellar which means uh, you know alternating layers of cementite and ferrite yeah okay here so this is the typical structure that you would see in an optical micrograph of perlite where it appears that you've got these separate layers of cementite and ferrite and for the past uh, 60 or so years the performance of railway lines has increased enormously by refining the spacing of the perlite yeah because if you refine the distance between the cementite and ferrite then you improve the strength the hardness of your material but actually the way that I described the structure is wrong okay. it doesn't consist of alternating layers of cementite and ferrite let me show you what it really looks like I really enjoy this slide okay so this is a cabbage and a, a cabbage has leaves which are all connected in three dimensions right so think of that as the crystal of cementite it's a single crystal of cementite and inside this I've got water and the water is a single crystal of ferrite so when I put the cabbage inside the bucket I've got a bicrystal of cementite and ferrite and the toughness is determined by the size of that bicrystal not by the spacing between the planes because the crystallography is identical within a colony you've got a single crystal of cementite which is intimately mixed with a single crystal of ferrite so if you have a crack then it propagates across the whole colony of perlite but the strength depends on the distance between the leaves of this cabbage you section that cabbage it looks like perlite right so although rails have improved in terms of their hardness their toughness remains quite low yeah so if we replace this 
by the structure that we've just created from a mixture of very fine plates of ferrite and carbon enriched films of retained austenite, we have no carbide particles in the material and both the toughness and the strength depend on the scale of the bainitic ferrite and films of austenite. So, we made railway lines out of this material, the bainitic ferrite and austenite and there are two main characteristics that are required from railway lines. One is called rolling contact fatigue. Okay? So when you have a wheel going over a surface, it induces a stress under the surface, a cyclic stress every time a wheel goes, and that causes fatigue. Okay? And then you get a bit of the steel just coming off. And of course, once you've damaged the surface, that damage grows every time something goes over it, and it can ultimately lead to fracture. Uh, this is the normal politic rail. These are full-scale tests. Normal politic rail. This is a rail which is hardened on the surface. And this is the new bainitic rail, which didn't break. So we stopped the test because these are extremely expensive tests. Okay? Now, the second characteristic that you require is wear resistance because you cause a little bit of damage every time a wheel goes over the surface and that causes wear of the rail and certainly if you're going around a curve then you also have specific areas from which you get wear. Uh, this is a rail which has been in service but one part of it is ordinary rail uh, and the other part is the new bainitic rail. So here is the carbide free bainitic rail and you can see that the damage here from wear processes is much bigger. And why, why is the wear resistance better? Well, if you have hard particles in your microstructure and they come off, then they will act like an abrasive. But we don't have these hard particles in the carbide-free bainite. It's just a mixture of austenite and ferrite. So if you look at the damage that you cause at the surface, it's more like plastic flow rather than uh, wear mechanism. And here are some quantitative results. Uh, the, the wear process is quite complicated. You know, it's not just uh, rolling but also slip. So the tests involve a certain amount of slip deformation between the two objects in contact. And we are looking both at the wheel and the railway line. So, uh, this is the wear rate on the wheel caused by moving on an ordinary politic rail and this is for martensite and this is the only structure which actually reduces the wear rate on the wheel as well. And this is the tunnel which goes under the sea between Britain and France and these are the rails made from carbide free bainitic ferrite. So just from three lectures, okay, you have the theory to be able to design a steel which can go into service. Okay. So if ever you come to Britain or to France, make sure you go through the Euro tunnel and you will be traveling on carbide free bainitic rail. Okay? Right. Um, I can show you some more examples. This is a torpedo car which carries molten steel going over a bainitic rail and so on. Now, of course, there are many other applications that you can think of, of this particular structure. And here I'm plotting the toughness, fracture toughness versus the ultimate tensile strength. And there's a whole collection of data from many different studies. And what I'd like you to see is, this is my raging steel. My raging steel is a martensitic steel, okay, a very highly alloyed martensitic steel and it has almost zero carbon and you quench it and then you heat treat it at around 500 degrees centigrade to precipitate intermetallic compounds and that makes it hard. But because it doesn't have the carbon, it's very tough and it's used for example for rocket motor casings. In some cases, we are matching the properties of my raging steels using much cheaper 
alloying addition. So here you're looking at incredible toughness, you know, about 130 megapascal root meters of toughness at a strength level of about 1600 megapascals. And these are quenched and tempered martensitic steels and these are, all, all of these are carbide free bainitic steels. There is much more potential with this structure uh, because of the absence of carbides. And for example, in GIFT itself, we have worked on producing these steels by continuous annealing. You know, just like you produce the trip assisted steels, we can produce without the allotromorphic ferrite and therefore get a much stronger trip steel as opposed to a trip assisted steel means there are other phases, you know, just like equiaxed ferrite in the structure. Okay. So, any questions? The most important point I want to get over to you is that if you understand the mechanisms of phase transformations, then you can find a logical way of creating a better steel. Instead of just making many, many different chemistries and looking at their properties. The simple equation here and the recognition that large regions of austenite are no good for the toughness helps to create actual products which go into service. Okay, that's all for today.